Well, ladies and gentlemen, how's it going? Not quite December yet. Uh, we are at the end of November. This is the Speed Street Podcast. We appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Connor Daly. Uh, normally, Joey Molinero is 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 the one doing the introduction. Uh, Joey is on vacation. Joey's at Disney with his family. Uh, we respect that, obviously. Uh, so it'll just be me today, uh, along with, uh, of course, our producer and uh, young man of the world, uh, Ben Walton. Ben, how are you doing today? Are you feeling better? Obviously, last last week it felt like you were fighting off uh, the world, the flu, the sickness, everything. Are you are you doing better? We're a lot better. We're on the mend. We're about like Excellent. at 90% right now. Okay. Uh, still a little congested, but I got the voice back. It might break a couple times, so I swear. Um, I think my voice is done developing, so that's not what the issue is. It's simply a sickness I have, so uh, please don't take ah. that the wrong way. But I'm doing well. How are you? How was your Thanksgiving? Good, good. Thanksgiving was fantastic. I hope everyone else had a great Thanksgiving. Um, got to eat some monkey bread, which made it on a list for our, our, our Thanksgiving podcast last year. Um, and, 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 and yeah, felt, felt great about it. I, I would love to know how everyone else is went. you know, feel free to tweet us, feel free to let us know how your Thanksgiving went. Um, I know I mentioned the Detroit lions game, uh, for my, my Thanksgiving podium. And I just want to say that that was the most disappointing thing I could have seen out of the Detroit lions. Uh, I love football. I love watching football. I like betting on football and I think the public bet a lot on the Detroit Lions. Um, that was just embarrassing. And again, it's it's a it's a something to this this football year has been such a weird ride of of teams being good, teams all of a sudden having a random case of the we suck. Um, and I, I just I, I found that to be sad. So again, Detroit Lions are still like eight and three or eight and four or something absurd. They have a ton of wins, but like, my gosh, that was sad. I, I was, I was, uh, that was a tough one to watch. But the rest of the games were very predictable. You know, Dallas Cowboys doing work. Uh, this is a motorsport podcast, but we love sports. Um, but yeah, Thanksgiving was fun. Did not play football, but it was a nice oh, day shocked. here in Indiana. Nice day. So we played That's basketball. Good. We oh, did a little okay. bit of, you know, throw the throw the ball at the hoop. You know, try to put balls in holes. You know what I mean? It was it was something like that. I always wish I was a basketball player. If I have a basketball, I'm gonna shoot it. And if there's a if there's a basketball hoop there, doesn't matter where it is, I'm gonna shoot that ball. Uh, I I love that feeling of we're gonna make one. Hey, if I if I get a swoosh, awesome, big day. I I I it feels good. There's there's something about a satisfying basketball shot. But I do you feel the same way. Or it's like, if you make it, oh, it's a great day. I think top five sound in sports, other than yep. a lot of racing, mm-hmm. loud racing noises. I think that. You seem like a guy that had like the toy basketball hoop in your room growing up. Absolutely. Up on the door. Yeah, yep. I mean, I had a few Little, of those in yep. my day. So practicing dunks and stuff, I can see it. Thousand percent. Spin around dunks. Just maybe, hey, we'll, we'll put mount that little tiny basketball, shoop, put that in there, take a couple shots. Uh, feel good every time you make it. There's something about m- making a shot on the basketball court that just feels tremendous. I, I don't know. I mean, I hope you guys agree with that. I, I think it's fantastic. Um, not a ton of racing news really going on. Uh, there, there is a you know a bit of chatter about this, that, and whatever. But because there is not a ton of racing news going on. We have a fantastic racing driver guest. We have a tremendous guest this week who has also a very good podcast. Who He told us kind of some numbers, and uh, there's a lot of people that listen to that show and watch that show on the YouTube. And again, thank you for watching on YouTube. If you do, uh, please also listen, be a friend, tell a friend. We're on the Spotify's. We're on the Apple Podcasts. You know, we, we are out there where people can listen to this show and we want to keep driving listenership. And if you and if you listened, and if you stopped listening, tell us why. You know what I mean? Let us know. You know, let us know what's going on. This is an interactive process. We want to make this something that you want to listen to every week. Do you think is it better to maybe go on Tuesday? I don't know. Let us let us know what you think. Because um, we love doing this show. I, I love doing this show a lot. Uh, means a lot. Anyway, our guest is Marcus Armstrong. Marcus Armstrong, Chip Ganassi Racing Driver, IndyCar Rookie of the Year, uh, fantastic driver, 
Um, very, very talented. He's going to be a full-time driver in the IndyCar Series next year. For, former Ferrari, uh, you know, Ferrari Junior driver in the Formula One world. Uh, you know, I have his, you know, if you if you buy Formula One sports cards like Jack Harvey and I do, uh, you've probably pulled his card from the F2 set. Uh, so, yeah, great conversation with uh, with Marcus. Definitely stay around for that one. It's a, it's a little bit longer of an interview than normal because he is a great speaker. He's from New Zealand. He sounds fantastic. I, I think him and Scott Dixon, unconfirmed, born in the same hospital potentially. So that might mean that, you know, they are, are are very, very talented drivers, and he's got a great future ahead of him. So we have a fantastic conversation. Uh, a few things that obviously, you know, went on. Formula One is now over. The Abu Dhabi Grand Prix happened. Uh, I slept through it. I'm not going to lie. And I, I'm a big Formula One guy now. I, I hope people enjoyed our Formula One recap of the Las Vegas Grand Prix. Um, but yeah, I, I did not get to see much of it. I know that there was some big news about the fact that Ferrari were not able to, you know, to keep their, their position in the constructors championship. Uh, you know, Williams were very excited to still finish seventh in the constructors championship. That's a big deal for them. I think a lot of us don't understand how much money those constructors, uh, positions are worth big, big money there in the constructors title. Uh, and then a huge week for young drivers. Um, I say there's not a lot of news, but Pat O'Ward, our IndyCar, our our IndyCar sword and shield over there in the Formula One world right now, uh, second on the board for the for Formula One Young Driver Day that he was in. Uh, we, we've got to be happy about that. I mean, again, testing is testing. These Formula One teams, especially more than the IndyCar teams, have a complete set of tests items that they want to get through that they might not even do a quick run at any point you know they might be doing heavy fuel the whole time they might be trying to test certain things for many different reasons um but always good to see our boy pato at near at or near the top of the time sheets for mclaren uh love to see mclaren having him involved there they obviously announced him as well as the official test and reserve driver one of the official test and reserve drivers for the Formula One team. I think that's great, Ben. Do you? I, I, that has to be something that is a positive for the sport, for IndyCar. It's cool to see, right? Formula One is cool right now. So to have our guy over there, to have our guy second on the board, obviously with a lot of young drivers out, th out there as well, but also a lot of regular Formula One drivers out there also, positive. Yeah, super positive. That makes two full-time IndyCar guys next year that are going to be in those uh, reserve slash test roles. So I think that's only Big. positive. And I think it just le legitimizes a lot of the young talent that we have here. So in America. Abs absolutely. I mean, that's a great point because you got Pietro Fittipaldi as well, obviously coming over to IndyCar. Um, it's just, it's a lot of that is just so positive. I, I think we as a group, as a series of IndyCar, as, as the IndyCar series should be, you know, pumping that out there. Um, love to see Pato, who I, we will get on this show at some point. Uh, I have texted him, but again, now that he's a Formula One guy, might be left on red a couple times. I don't know. I, I, I've, I've also Pato and I have raced pretty aggressively at the ED 500 a couple times, so me might not think too highly of me. But I don't know. We'll see. We're trying to fight for the win of the Indy 500. He wants to be that guy that he says brings the Indy 500 to McLaren. Uh, you know, it's been many years since the McLaren name has has been a victor. Uh, you know, at the Speedway. So just good to see. Good to see the Formula One doing young driver tests. I think that there is, you know, I wish that there was more of that back in the day, but love to see that now. Uh, getting to see Pietro Fittipaldi do a ton of laps over there. You know, it's good for him to be out there. Obviously, any off-season time you can get, you know, that's going to help him when he comes back to the IndyCar series. Um, so again, a lot of great stuff going on over there. Love to see it. Um, I think... Seeing that championship end the way it did, the Formula One World Championship, Max just a send-off victory again. Only one race in that entire season that was not won by Red Bull. Uh, I, I mean, that is just, that's hard to believe. But I, I respect the dynasty, you know what I mean? I, re I respect that. Obviously, we saw the New England Patriots and the NFL just beat the brakes off of everyone for years too. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much of that that, you have to respect, you know, as as a youth growing up, I hated seeing the Patriots win so much. I even, back when Michael Schumacher was winning all the world championships for Ferrari, 
I, it was like, I didn't like that as much. I, I thought he was, you know, the best driver in the world at the time, but I was like, it didn't, it, it for me, I like to see competition. I like to see, you know, the, a, a diversity of winners, a, a bunch of different winners, you know what I mean? Uh, but you do have to, as I've been in the sport longer, I do respect how strong that is. And, and I, and I do respect the fact that that's pretty impressive. Will we ever see a dominance like that in a season again? I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I hope not, but you got to respect that. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's good for them. Only them. That's it. I would say. Well, who knows even how happy they are about it? Did you see the, I think Adam Stern tweeted it earlier today that Max says that he'll retire from F1 if the series focuses too much on entertainment. I so saw even if you're that, like yeah. winning yeah. and they're like hyping up you winning, then even then he's like, uh, there's more, what do you say? Definitely there's so many more things out there anyway. You know, it's not only about Formula One and life. Well, like, you just won almost all the races of the year and they're like, eh, like that's so Yeah, funny. it's like, man, the race, you know, I'm not yeah. a big, I, that's fascinating again, but Max yeah. is a dog. He can say whatever yep. he wants. He's got that yep. dog in him. He's a big, you know, he he's one of the best drivers, if not the best driver in the world currently. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, he can say whatever he wants, but it's kind of an interesting mod, like, like Nico Rosberg, when Nico Rosberg won the formula one world championship, he was like, yep, I'm done. That's it. You know what I mean? Like if you get what you want out of it, you know, I, I sometimes thought to myself, you know, obviously I've been in this career for a while and IndyCar is, you know, there, I've had a lot of tough, a, a tough time in that sport, but like, if I won the Indy 500 next year, I might just be like, yeah, that's, I don't care about anything else. You know what I mean? Like. I'll go, I'll go find something else to do. I, I, you know, my, my goal right now is to do a lot more NASCAR racing. I'd love to be a full-time NASCAR truck series driver. That's definitely the goal. Um, but it'd be funny to be able to do that because that it's, you've put in so much work, you put in so much effort to winning. Uh, and then having said that, now that I just said that, I think to myself, that's stupid. I would still want to race the Indy 500. I love the Indy 500. So I would keep coming back to the Indy 500 until I literally have to be put in a wheelchair, like because I can barely walk, my my limbs are old. Uh, I I would love to be able to you know do the Indy 500 for many more years, but it's it's interesting to see the the mental landscape of a driver. Right, everyone is different. Max might get so much satisfaction out of the pure competition, pure racing, the pure side of it, you know, because he he criticized the Las Vegas Grand Prix a lot about not being a pure racing form. Well, like you're not doing a lot of pure racing yourself because you're just beating the brakes off everyone. So again, maybe when we see a year like he has to fight for it, you know, that last race, the championship fighting, you know, fighting Lewis Hamilton for the, for the world title that everyone argues about still, you know, maybe he gets that satisfaction out of it again. I, I do hope we see a, a season next year where it is one for one, like, Max, boom, Lewis, boom, Ferrari, so, someone, uh, someone winning every now and then. So it's a battle to the end because, again, that makes, so, that just makes for such a fun experience as a viewer. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Formula One is done and dusted. Everything is officially done. Uh, we, we've got nothing left on the list now. It's kind of a sad time of year for motorsport, but. Let's look at the positives. It's all ahead of us now. The, the The seasons are ahead of us. We've got driver announcements still to look forward to. We've got things to be happy about for the next season. Um, we've got now again, Ben. You mentioned what else did you mention on the NASCAR seat? There was some, there was some some news maybe dropping in NASCAR land. Yeah, there's some interesting developments as far as teams looking to add a third car uh we were talking about before we recording about rfk just announced this morning uh today's wednesday the 29th for recording that they are going to be fielding the 60 car not in the xfinity series that they made famous but it'll be a third cup car and it looks like it'll be part-time and they're gonna be running at the 500 and i think by the time this is definitely posted they'll have the driver announcement it looks like it's david reagan i'm pretty sure oh from what the video david that they posted. reagan david reagan yeah so they'll be not... back at roush yeah. but that's um, not now again. I when I was at Roush for my one time Xfinity start, you know they they do love those numbers that they're the six, they're the yep. you know the they, the sixty has has appeared before in their in their lineup. Um, so I thought that was cool. Again, I, when I saw that video pop up on the internet, I was like, "What in the world is this? I have no idea who it is." 
Now, if it's David Reagan, I, I would say that's that's maybe less exciting than than what Project Ninety One does. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Maybe, but maybe there's more. Maybe there's more. David Reagan, obviously, great driver. Um, but maybe there's more excitement for that number sixty team next year. Is it something that's run more more often? I don't know. That'd okay. be cool. Maybe I should give him a call. I don't know. That'd yeah, be awesome. Who knows? <laughs> I, I I mean, I'd imagine with because it will be an open car. It won't have a charter. So obviously, I think like they're doing with Project Ninety One. Even um, RCR is talking with Brody Kotesky. You, you just won the yeah. Supercar Championship. So Brody Kotesky, yeah, have, Supercar yeah, Champion. Yeah. So they're going to add it, have him run a few races this year. It's so I don't know if this is going to be like a, hey, bring us money and whatever, or if there's a little more intentionality behind this. If, if Ford's going to throw money at this and just kind of maybe if they have any development guys in the ranks that they want to bring up, which doesn't really look like there's anything super big coming up in NASCAR at the moment with them. So I'd be interested to see what they're going to do. Um, I think it's more cars on the grid, so more competitive cars, that is. So I think that can only do good things. Absolutely. No, I agree. I think that's awesome. Uh, I love the I love the Project Ninety One thing. I, I do think that that's great. We kind of have our own, uh, you know. We we have our one offs at the Indy Five Hundred. You know what I mean? Like right. for the Indy from the IndyCar side, we get to see guys like Kyle Larson come out there. You know what I mean? We get we get to see teams like Dry Rumble be like, hey, this this is our this is our big show, right? We yeah. got two cars running in that one. Um, so I, I I wish you know there is more of that. I wish that there could be, let's say. Dry Rhymeball shows up at other races too, but the Indy 500 is the Indy 500. It's still the most valuable race for us. Um, I, I think in the NASCAR side, they do have the ability to run that Project 91 car at more road courses. It's not as difficult for them because they already have a full-time team running at the highest level. Um, so yeah, very cool to see. I, I, I already kind of have that Indy 500 excitement flowing because... It's, you know, that that's going to be one of my focuses. Obviously, I, I'm not going to be a full-time IndyCar driver. Maybe this is a breaking news type segment, but like I, probably I, I, I am not actually even pursuing a full-time IndyCar seat anymore. On the record, on the record. Now. On the record, so, I, I'm yep. not pursuing that. That's there's, huh. there's nothing unless, you know, again, if Dale Coyne calls me and says, hey, Connor, everything is funded. We got this going. Like I, I would entertain that conversation. But again, that's a car that needs a lot of funding. I, I, and, and and I had a great conversation with Dale Coyne not too long ago. I love talking with Dale Coyne. Great guy. But again, th there is an element of funding that is that is needed there, that is necessary, that I, I do not possess. Um, so I, I, But I'm fine with that. But I have a great look at a, a, a potential Indy 500 seat, uh, one if not two. Uh, I, I even looked at a contract today. So um, love to see that. Uh, and, and it gets me pumped. But, you know, my goal, and, and I think that we have made some progress on this, is is hopefully going more full-time towards the NASCAR Truck Series season. I actually had a great call the other day with an Xfinity team that I didn't expect to have a call with. Um, but again, need need funding that I don't have. But uh, I, I am trying to turn my attention more towards the NASCAR realm. Uh, doing a full-time season in the truck series is is not technically possible if I'm doing the month of May too, but you know I'd have to miss a race. Um, but but that would be my goal. You know, that, it's not necessarily breaking news. I've kind of dropped this a little, you know, dropped hints about this a little bit. But but we're excited about the future. I, I think there's a lot of great things going on. Working with the folks at Bit Nile, Todd All, you know, got to speak at his conference after the Vegas F1 race, uh, Risk on 360. Um, so that there's. There's a lot of great things going on, but again, my hype for the Indy 500, as we we're talking about it there, it get, it get, I'm excited about it. So to so to see that, to be able to do that, uh, you know, is is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, but we got to you know got to work through the details, got to figure it out, got to see what you know what 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 are we going to make? How are we going to make this happen? When are we going to make this happen? But the but the energy is very positive around that, and I need that in my life right now. There's been so much just garbage that we've gone through this year that I, I like to be excited about something that's cool coming up. You know what I mean? So it's nice to have that. It's nice to have some excitement about doing something at the, at a high level. Um, and, and so we'll see what happens. But as for now, we're not going to have any podiums this week. We're going to focus on our guest. Uh, I think we have an incredible conversation and, and a little bit of more of an extended conversation with our guest. Uh, and, and we want to have Joey back next week. And we're going to get into it. So let's get into our guest right now before wandering on about any other racing stuff. Um, Marcus Armstrong, Chip Ganassi racing driver, 
in the NTT IndyCar series. Well, we are back to having a fantastic guest, an IndyCar related guest, um, a young man, which makes me feel old, uh, born in the year of 2000, uh, which is terrifying. Uh, a man from very far away, uh, many, many, many miles, many countries away, uh, New Zealander, uh, Marcus Armstrong, thank you for being here. IndyCar Rookie of the Year, uh, Ganassi motor racing driver, uh, incredible year for you this year, an incredible future ahead of you. How you doing, my friend? How's your uh, how's your off season treating you? Hey, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, Are I'm, you born I'm in the year two thousand? Is Wikipedia correct? <laughs> I was born in July two thousand. So there you go. About <laughs> eighty years after Scott Dixon. So uh, there you go. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Were you guys born in the same hospital? <laughs> Is that where all the good <laughs> racing drivers are born? <laughs> there's only one there's only one hospital in new zealand so naturally Fair. we were <laughs> no no uh yeah it's been a good good off season mate um thank you for your introduction i feel um i feel like that's the ego boost that i needed this morning uh absolutely but no it's still good it's still good bro I, I just got back from london last night and uh just moved into my new apartment here in carmel so uh, i'm shocked by the temperature of this of this <laughs> place in the winter but it's uh so good it's not great i i i will say it, it dropped drastically and then I, I i i woke up yesterday morning and it was snowing as well so not not a tremendous time of year but the season is great cold yes but the season is great love this time of year um how long are you staying around here like are you do you guys have any testing in december usually there's a sebring test like in the middle of december or are you going to go home for Christmas? What's the what's the off season plan? Yeah, we do have a test coming up in December. Uh, we've been we've been pretty lucky, really, with with the amount of mileage that we've had over the over the past well couple of months with that uh, the introduction of the new hybrid yeah. power unit. So that's uh, that's been um, amazing. Just to actually just bat around and get some laps. You don't often get that, especially coming from Europe, when you're limited to about eight sets of tires over the course of three days, and yeah. they disintegrate within five minutes. You don't often get a lot of time to dial yeah. in, so <laughs> it's been quite nice um, on that uh, on that side. But I will go back to New Zealand, I think uh, maybe mid December if I can. Just um, I would actually like to stay here, honestly, and just sort of do training and hang yeah. out and. You know, go get a beer with Connor Daly, but <laughs> you know, I, uh, <laughs> interesting. You know, I'll I'll leave that to the imagination of the listener, but it's, it's always fun doing that. Um, but no, I I want to go back and see my family, obviously, and just um, also I'm I'm used to a summery uh, Christmas, so mm. going back to New Zealand for Christmas is always fun, and. Um, you know, get some sun and all of that, all that boring stuff. So, yeah. I like that. I like that. Well, you know what? Christmas can be fun here. If you, there is a, a go-kart race December 7th. If you do feel like doing that, I was told to maybe get another IndyCar driver. It's in the state, the football stadium, downtown Indianapolis. So who knows if you want to do that, maybe we can do that. I'm going to do it. It's going to be an electric go-kart race there. So anyway, we can talk about that later if you want. You'd probably be really good at it because you're a tiny man. Um, anyway, <laughs> getting into let's let's go back into the history a little bit. You came through the Formula Three series, the Formula Two series, when the hype was at maximum, right? Like, I, I buy F1 trading cards, and guess who's in there? Boom, Marcus Armstrong. I'm an F2 guy, and here's my signature. You know what I mean? Like it's. F1 had the hype. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on. You know, F1 junior driver programs were killing it. Um, I see random F1 Twitter accounts just talking about you because they're like, who is his girlfriend? And it's like, it's almost like they're talking about celebrities. Like it's, it's, it's an amazing world because when I did F2, it was GP2 and people in America or most people in the world just thought that was like a, a, a an addition equation like there was some weird math problem that was going on g times p equals 2 I, it was very strange so like 
the 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 time of the support series getting more popular what was that like going through i guess that different era because you still got to win you still got to be successful but when there's a lot more attention on on you guys i feel like was that did you start to feel that at a younger age than you expected well off the bat i i don't think that gp2 and gp3 was low key when you were there because i remember <laughs> watching you in gp3 and gp2 uh oh, back when, when I you was, were like seven was... sitting by the christmas tree or something like that <laughs> You're actually, you're not far off, man. I was probably about 10. And I, I remember watching you in an uh, in ART and then, am I right in saying a case room in GP2? No, I, I was Rossi. Yeah. I was with the Lazarus GP Venezuela team for 12 <laughs> races or whatever yeah. that was. Right. Yeah. No, so I, 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 I knew you from that. So that was actually televised. Every single race was televised in New Zealand back then for you guys. So, um, watching you guys i drew inspiration from that so i wouldn't say that it was low key at all um but then i think a lot has to be said for Mick Schumacher because at the time uh i'd say just before Mick arrived in thrift so it wasn't that big like they just started a documentary series chasing the dream which rory child makes and he, he does a lot of stuff with me and does a great job he just started that just as Mech arrived into F2. And with the combination of uh, the Verstappen and Hamilton rivalry, <clears throat> the F2 documentary and Mech, it was like an explosion of eyeballs. You know, like so many people were watching all of a sudden. Uh, because it wasn't like that in F3. Well, I did Euro F3 in 2018 and Mech was actually my teammate. And it was it was completely normal. It was like being in F4, you know. Yeah, um, but then F F two suddenly just completely blew up, um, which was cool. I mean, at the time, well, even now, I I didn't even think twice about it. But having Mick there and competing against competing against him was kind of like the whole world was watching, you know. So yeah. that was cool. <laughs> um, and together with that, I was in the Ferrari Academy. So naturally, naturally, you have a lot of Italians watching the the italian fan base is extremely passionate and i was uh, learning italian at the time so all of my interviews were were broadcasted on sky italia or my terrible um my terrible english uh sorry my terrible pigeon italian was embarrassing did you learn it did you become fan- fluent i i wouldn't say fluent but i can <laughs> i can i can say what i want to say you, you know, can navigate for some yeah. reason <laughs> some reason when i have like a couple of like for example if i'm on the podium and i have like a you know a good chug of the champagne i am then somehow five times better at italian it doesn't make sense but <laughs> i think that's there's a scientific that that just makes sense that's that's just drinking science is what that is <laughs> so uh yeah the italian fan base was huge and even even now uh when i when I look at my socials statistics, the majority of my fan base is actually Italian. So um, that's it's cool. I mean, going back to your original question, I've gone off topic a little bit, but that's I didn't right. really, I didn't really feel the the external pressure from any of that because I don't know. Maybe it's just you, you know what it's like. You're a, you're a racing driver as well. You know, the I'd say the internal pressure to to perform is a lot more than you know anyone else watching on tv so i would say when i knew my mom and dad were watching on tv that probably made me more nervous so (laughs) yeah that's a big part of it that's a big part of it yeah it's it's just fascinating to see i think you know we all go through that when you when you get to the top level you spend years just hoping to get that chance right to get that chance to make a living being a race car driver right to to go from the support race practices at 8 a.m. to like the main show and you can kind of show up unless you're doing a, you know, IndyCar street race and there's an odd schedule and you have to have a warm up for like 8 a.m. or whatever, but you want to be the main event. How close, how close do you think you were to being in Formula One? What, what, uh, cause again, I was one race away from continuing my Formula One contract, right? Like you're, you're kind of always one 
little maybe small step or opportunity away from getting that chance does it what how how close was it the ferrari relationship was good was there not enough seats open at the time what do you think or is it not dead yet are we still going to be there next year i don't know (laughs) (laughs) no man i'm i'm pretty happy where i am right now but uh no i mean at the time at the time in the ferrari academy there was myself Callum Mylott, Mick Schumacher, Giuliano Alessi, and Robert Schwartzman. And all five of us were in F2 together. And it, it, I don't know how to put this properly, but. (laughs) You say what you need to say, bro. (laughs) The the opportunity just wasn't going to come at that time. Uh, You know, I I stuck around the year after to to be like the test and. developed driver but the the genuine opportunity of actually getting a seat was slim just i would say callum was probably closer he it was his second year of f2 and it was the perfect moment for him because he was he was in in my opinion the best team he had a great year and unfortunately he didn't get the seat but i would say it was a it was a crescendo of all five of us arriving to f2 together and you know the opportunity just didn't come about um then saying that i mean i wouldn't change it for anything you know like i will get into it later but um yeah i always kept an eye on indycar as as the coolest racing championship in the world so um (laughs) even back then i I actually shared an apartment with callum and we were you know (laughs) A bit, you know, we wouldn't tell each other everything, but we we're like, hmm, yeah, that indie car looks pretty damn cool. Oh, I wouldn't mind it going does, there. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, I loved living there. I, I lived in Maranello for six years, which is um, a long time, and just I spent around a hundred days a year on the simulator there, just uh, grinding away. Yeah, it was, it, it was a uh, interesting time. And I feel like I learned a lot just from a, a professional standpoint because Ferrari was, I mean, Ferrari is changing quite frequently, you know, its management and its engineering squad and all of that. So learning new personalities and, and trying to, uh, yeah, work with amazing engineers who have been uh, succeeding in Formula One for many years. At the time, they would... Um, trust every word i was saying when it came to certain development items you know on a simulator so that for me was a, a great responsibility that i really enjoyed and i could take over here to america yeah i mean that's that's not a small group to be working with like to be like yeah i'm at the you know ferrari formula one factory and we're doing some work 100 days a year in the simulator it's like well that's there are not many human beings <laughs> that get to say that so that's a that's a pretty cool situation you know what i mean i I did a ton of simulator work back in my days of the Force India Formula One team, but like it was what before simulators got really, really cool essentially. So like it was not quite <laughs> as much as a hundred days a year, but my gosh, there's a lot of work. Um, transitioning well, now, right? Worrying. No, go ahead. I, I, one more thing. Nowadays, you know, they have those rules where the young drivers have to do a certain amount of, amount of um, I think it's FP, FP1s. Yeah, yeah. One. Which is huge. So, yeah, that's 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 a game changer because I feel like that's an incentive to keep the young guys, you know, there as reserve drivers, as opposed to looking at other championships. Because when I was sort of in that in that range, uh, you yeah, know, we I got a couple of days in F one, um, but it was more so, you know, just private testing at Fiorano and and old cars, you know. So. Um, now with that it's it's definitely a game changer and it's it's really good for for young guys because you actually get the chance to go out there and well sit on the other side of the garage to lewis hamilton or you know yeah. and it's mandatory for all, for all the teams to do so rules um, are rules I think yeah. <laughs> I, I personally think it's awesome when i turn on the tv yeah. and i see all the young guys having a crack at f1 i think it's the, it's the coolest thing it is super exciting and like again 10 years ago or whatever they were like you know it, it, it there was just that transition there there wasn't a ton of fp1 stuff going on but it started happening and you're like a lot of teams at the time before all the business boom it was like well we can maybe charge like half a million euros 
for, for this day, for this session. And then, then I was like, oh, well, now it's a bit messy. But now it's it seems like we're going to give these chances to actually these young drivers who deserve a shot at it, which I think is is much better than kind of going through that rough era of like, maybe we just charge for it. So I, I think we're in a better spot for sure. Um, yeah. Making the switch over to IndyCar, obviously road and street courses for you first, right? And several other drivers have done that. You know, Grosjean did that at first. Was that always the the case, or was it was that the only opportunity at the time that was with Ganassi, or was ha, what it was it ever talked about? Like, hey, I'm going to come over here and just boom, jump in and do the full season right away. Uh, that opportunity didn't come about with Ganassi for the first year. Obviously, I would have loved to have done it, um, but uh, yeah, the, I mean, it all came about fairly late, honestly, and. And there was opportunities with other teams as well to do the full season, uh, but I'm uh, yeah. well. I'm a you picked the right one. Sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a historian of the sport, man, and and I've been watching, you know, Chip Ganassi racing and Scott Dixon and Dario Franchitti dominate since I was a little bambino. So when I got the call <laughs> up, I don't, I don't know if you ever. I don't know if you ever turn down that opportunity, so, uh, even if you aren't doing the overalls. So, uh, you know, it's it's certainly, a, well, for lack of a better phrase, um, a baptism of fire. You know, oh, rocking yeah. up to St. You haven't been to the track before. The car is, you know, obviously an animal. It's not too dissimilar to F2 uh, in the sense that, you know, the horsepower is not too dissimilar, that, downforces there or thereabouts but the way this car moves around and how robust this tire is just sort of yeah it took me by surprise because you can actually just take you know grab the car by the scruff of the neck and drive the wheels off it you know so that was uh yeah, a bit of an eye opener first weekend at st pete uh i would have loved to have done ovals on on the first year uh i don't think it was a terrible decision not to do it on the first year because yeah it is a it is a learning experience and since then we have done a couple of days uh, and we've sort of you know taken taken it as progressively as we can uh at texas and indy so i feel like that was probably the best way to go about it having a, a season under my belt in indycar before actually you know doing it but um you know if the opportunity did come about 12 months ago for sure i would have taken it with both hands yeah. but yeah certainly it's um i think it's quite a good thing i'm i don't know what your opinion is on that but well i mean i i ha i mean you got to do what you got to do right like it, technically when i you know got back into the series i was only doing road and street courses in indy 500 right but somehow ended up in uh you know in the carlin car for all the ovals too but it was something that you you take the races you can get and it's kind of the perfect case scenario for you because even though you missed the oval races, still rookie of the year. So that that's a, that's a big flex. Like I didn't do all the races, still rookie of the year, and you only get one chance of being a rookie. So I had to go my rookie year. I had to go against Alex Rossi, and he won the Indy 500, and it was double points, and I crashed. So that was a, that was a terrible situation. But I, I I love the fact that you guys are getting this opportunity to do some oval testing, right? Let's see your first impressions of the ovals, right? The super speedways. Like, what what was that? Again, completely changes when there's a bunch of other idiots out there with you. But Texas and Indy, good days, interesting feeling. Was it everything you kind of expected? Well, it was. Uh, it's difficult to even prepare for a test like that because I don't know what to expect. I don't know how it's going to feel. Um, I can only imagine what the speed and the, the sensation and the G-force, the compression, all the rest of it's going to feel like. So honestly, jumping into the car at Texas was one of the more nervous moments of uh, of my career yeah. just because I didn't <laughs> really know what it was going to feel yeah. like. So Scott jumped in the car. He did about five laps, went out the box, flat out, and didn't. I'm pretty sure he just glued his right foot to the pedal and didn't, yep. you know, didn't even think about it, uh, which filled me. Scott with, Dixon science, uh, we love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he came in. He's like, "Yeah, so sweet, mate, jump in." 
And that was cool because at least I know the car is capable of doing it. So yeah. I'm extremely lucky when, you know, I get Scott to jump in. I don't know if you know this guy, but he's won a few races. I've heard and, of him, yeah. Um, seen him on the television. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, car's sweet. That fills you with confidence because you know that if you commit hard on lap one, you're probably not going to get any surprises. And saying that, I did take my time because, well, it's fast. So I thought, yeah, the, the thing that struck me was you can't really breathe when you're in the compression at Texas. Yeah. That's, that's Yes. People have so no idea feels... how much load and how difficult that is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like the feeling of the car, I sort of got used to throughout the day and like I said with Tom Blomquist recently, you get you go into turn one or you go into turn turn three and you just you go in, you hope the rear doesn't snap on entry and then you just crank block mid corner. Um but you get you kinda get used to that, but it's the sort of the physical aspect of it that you know, the steering weight is, was heavier than I expected. The compression obviously, like I said, um and then obviously being my first day, I, I was conscious of the fact that I wasn't really letting myself rest into the headrest very much. So Oh yeah, yeah. Um I would say that uh as the day progressed, I, I tried to focus on that just to become a little bit more comfortable and you know, make 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 the run a bit more sustainable in a way, uh, and not wear myself out. But I thought it went really well. I mean, obviously a test always you know, the test goes as well as you make it, right? You, you're not truly competing against anyone, but from a comfortability standpoint, obviously the Ganassi car was on rails and we had it on, uh, you know, set up pretty safely. Uh, so I felt I felt like it couldn't have really gone any better. And then obviously Andy, we did the rookie orientation as well. So, and that was <laughs> totally different, you know, like, yeah, I feel like you had had a bit more time to think obviously i wasn't running in traffic but the i'd, I'd say it's the, the mental capacity to just be constantly you know trying to be what's the word very precise on every input you know that's quite um that struck me at test at indy where you i feel like when i'm hacking around long beach or something you can sort of you, you your mind can wander a little bit and you can still make it around the lap you know in a yeah. fairly good way i feel like at indy it's like nah you actually kind of need to you really need to focus on every single input so <laughs> i loved it man. i loved it and it's going to be a, it's going to be a great journey i'm, I'm sure it's, it's going to be a learning curve to it uh, the, there always is but uh, i feel excited about it just because it's it's something different and it's an, it's an amazing thing that not many people get the opportunity to do yeah, no, you're right. Ben, I know you have a question for, for Marcus as well. We're going to get Ben in here. You guys are probably the same age. You guys are both children. <laughs> yeah, I was 01, so I think oh, probably should be on me. So if that makes you feel any better, Connor. Um, I kind of want to go back to talk about the kind of younger guys getting F1 opportunities. And you see Pietro Fittipaldi, he's still going to be a Haas reserve driver, I believe. And you have Alex Pelot doing some testing with Flair and Pato. Do you really like... How do you think those guys take advantage of still having those F1 connections while doing IndyCar? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm cognizant of that because there's always something to learn from from over there, whether it be, you know, the way you set up the car or the way you drive in terms of time management or just tools that are they're constantly evolving, um, you know, everything. So I, I do my best to try and you know keep friends over there just to sort of stay in the loop of what they're sort of doing and and how they're developing uh i even did macau a couple of weeks ago which was i do have questions sort of about good... that that's very exciting because <laughs> a lot of our listeners might not know much about the macau grand prix which i think is again a very very incredible yeah. race so continue i will we'll, we'll definitely get into that yeah so the macau grand prix like sort of coming back and and driving Pirellis again and and sort of yeah that's it's you can learn a lot 
and you can take it back to IndyCar, I think, just in, in that sense. So I, I feel like the guys that do have F1 connections, if they, you know, they obviously are very intelligent guys, so they're going to take that opportunity and run with it. But you can learn from everyone uh, over there as you can here. And uh, one thing I think Europe is very, very good at generally is tire management and how they, or just generally how they understand tires. And that was um, quite apparent to me when I arrived here. You know, obviously this tire is think, a bit less complicated and a more basic. Uh, but I'd say as as IndyCar evolves and the car becomes a bit more complicated and whatnot, the tire is obviously the thing that connects the car to the tarmac. So it's, it's important to understand that well. So, um, yeah, long story short, I feel like they do have an advantage. Clearly, it's more information. Uh, and I guess all I can do is just keep friends and try and gossip as much as I can and figure out what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, Macau. So for those that don't know much about Macau, like it's, it's, I did not get to do that race, which is a shame. I almost did with double R back in the day. I did one F3 race, um, back in, in my era. Uh, but Macau was something we were looking at doing an incredible street race with so much history. Um, you know, what was it like going back though? Like I, 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 it's been a while since I've seen, I guess it was a big race as you're coming through the ladder system, right? Like everyone was doing it. All the, you know, aspiring Formula One drivers, big time pros were doing it, but you got a chance to go cut. Like you're at the top now. You, you, you went through that, but going back to an F3 car, like what was that like? Was it, was it, was it fun to do? Did, did it, be, did it feel like, oh, I'm, I'm already a pro. I better beat the rest of these guys. But obviously there are still a bunch of good drivers at that level, right? What, what was that experience like? Yeah, man, I love Macau. It's a, it's an amazing race. I did it twice already before, and in my biased opinion, I should have won it in 2019. And uh, so I wanted to come back and do it. Mm. And the opportunity came about very late with MP Motorsport. Luckily, um, Chip and Mike and everyone at Ganassi was fully on board with me doing it. So... I went ahead and did it. It's a, it was weird, man. Like the first, first free practice, the memories I had of F3 were a little bit different. Um, <laughs> back, back in the day, I was in Grandmire as well. And we had quite a, um, well, I wouldn't say that actually. Good team. But Very we, good, it, team. Yeah, <laughs> good team. Good right? team. Yeah. And uh, I, I sort of jumped in the car. First stop, I didn't even make a seat. I used... I used their existing driver's seat for the race. Oh, all right. Uh, Frank, Franco, Franco Golopinto. I used his seat, his molds, his pedal position, his steering position, everything. The only thing that changed was the <laughs> crutch belts. And uh, loose. Wow. Of course. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big hammer on this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Loosen those suckers up now that he's an IndyCar driver <laughs> driving on ovals. Yeah. <laughs> Loosen up those crotch belts, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, no. continue. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Terrible. Anyway, um, <laughs> I've I've gone out the box for F P one, and I'm I'm like, this is it feels weird. Like you have to actively be like correcting the steering on the straight because the steering's so light, and then and I steel brakes, and so they were like came in immediately, it, and also the car was is so light that it just felt oh, yeah. like felt like I was it was mental and uh, it took me about FP1 to get used to I reckon and then uh, you know I'm sort of a bit old fashioned you know because Macau you usually you would build up to it and you would try and reach your peak let's say in Q2 um, wow. I don't know if we were more cognizant of you know crash crash damage or you know ruining our confidence early in the weekend or what but nowadays these kids man they go out the box and they just go flat out balls to the walls from the first lap of fp1 so um i felt like okay maybe i should actually push a bit here and try and you know i'm gonna because <laughs> you know i tried to build up to it um and eventually we got to q2 and i felt pretty comfortable we had a good session um, which he led most of the session and just got pipped at the end. And, but I was kind of like, yeah, I feel 
totally comfortable in this car again and this track is it gives a crazy adrenaline rush because you're like you know the track corner but for those at home it's like you're literally racing through the mountains of macau and yeah <laughs> if you didn't know any better if you didn't know any better every corner looks the same like you're just absolutely hacking through these <laughs> tiny narrow streets at high speed as well and um and so it gives a crazy adrenaline rush the thing i didn't like about it was the pirelli were you you couldn't exactly so for example you go out you do out warm push which in, in any car is foreign because you just do out push but yeah. then you do your first two push laps and every lap you have a completely different car underneath you just based on yeah. how the tire is so that kind of you know it didn't give me a whole lot of confidence just to go absolutely flat out because sometimes you didn't really know what you had underneath you. Yeah. So but I had to try and learn that quick, but, um, <laughs> all in all, I thought we did a, we did a great job. It was unlucky. We were, we were P5 and race one until, uh, we, uh, we had a crash with Hadjar. He basically just went right hand down on me and gave me a puncture. So, um, that's that good. Was basically <laughs> That was basically our, our good result possibility over, but I loved it, man. I thought it was a great weekend, a crazy track, and I hope that I inspire more older guys, you know, more you know, people who are IndyCar, F2, whatever it is, um, to, to go and do it because it's a cool race and it's not an, it's not during our season either. So um, I'd love to go back and do it again. I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd be, It'd be cool. I mean, I would do it. Me, like, but... I, I, I would, I would one thousand percent do it. I, I, if, if someone, if a team, a three team came to me and say, "Hey, we'd love you to do it." The only problem is, is like, a lot of times they're like, "Well, we need at least a uh, hundred thousand dollars to do it," or something like this. And I'm like, "Well, sorry, I'm not in that era anymore." But I, yeah. I mean, if they had an opportunity, I think it'd be awesome. I, I that'd be that, that's such a cool race. I'm glad you had a good time doing it because again, it keeps you busy too in the off season. Keeps the body right, keeps the mind right, keeps it sharp. Yep. No, I, I think it's it's a cool race. And, and Macau is a bit different to every other track, I think, because they can actually find local sponsors and stuff. So, yeah, you know, like, I I think, like, you know, a whole bunch of older guys came back and did it. Just, um, yeah. well, I mean, I hope next year Colton comes with me because Colton yeah. was talking to me about it. Uh, maybe probably two weeks before i left he said it's such a cool race i'd love to do it and i was like bro like there are seats available come on let's do it yeah <laughs> and, yeah uh well he didn't end up doing it but i'm gonna try and yeah. convince some i mean that would be funny imagine like there'd be big publicity for the series too i'm sure they'd be like yeah hey you know what we're we're we're, we're pros like let's go and let's go out there and do it let's get it let's get after it i'd be fun i'd be down that's what i'm in <laughs> <laughs> i'm not like thrilled about going back on pirelli tires obviously but it, you know, it is what it is. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I appreciate the time that you spent with us, but you're also a podcaster. I want to get into this really quick. Uh, despite you also wearing a Jets hat, which is wildly offensive in the state of Indiana, but you're a podcaster. Is that fun? I mean, they're like you guys, I think Screaming Meals is the program. I, I've enjoyed my show, right? I, I I don't know how to tell what's going on, and 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 I, I think people like it. I love talking to people about motorsport, but your podcast, I would say, is a bit different than 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 normal. But do you enjoy it? Have a good time with it? Is it something that you want to continue doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I'm doing it for fun. It's a yeah. uh, it's a nice distraction from you know motorsport. I would say. And in actual fact, it's not supposed to be a motorsport podcast at all. It's yeah. uh, we na- we we named it Screaming Meals um, based on a New Zealand TV show, which is a fishing show where they never catch any fish. <laughs> so we thought, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> me and my uh, me and my mate James Blair, we we decided that oh that'd be so funny. Let's I'm going to start a food blog called Screaming Meals, <laughs> and then. For some reason, we decided to to do a podcast, and but we we thought it'd only be funny if we did it like way OTT, where like we all dressed up in suits, like the production value was just like 
way too high and we had like a you're nice like trolling studio. you're troll you're a troll you're a bunch of trolls yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then we go and like do wine tasting or like initially we had like a rule wherever you said the words tied egg you had to do a shot of tequila so like <laughs> it's a great show oh man you'd love it you gotta come on sometime and uh so we yeah we just thought it'd be fun and now it's actually a cool one just to bro down with with other drivers because um you know i i we don't we don't tend to talk about motorsport that much you know we, we want to just chit chat and it's not really an interview but it's just a conversation much like this so uh i feel like yeah i, I don't think the american like indie car fan base actually know what it is or follow it but uh, <laughs> it's 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 uh it's total nonsense really and i mean i'm looking forward to doing we've got a few more coming out in the next couple of weeks you got tom block and we've got Nick Cassidy, and I think there's a few others as well um, later in the month. And yeah, we're just going to just hang out, do some wine tasting, and see where it takes us. That, I mean, man, that's, that sounds like a tremendous program. I don't know why we haven't locked <laughs> in on that more often. I, 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 I appreciate you coming on. If For the folks that have not checked that out, right, our show, you know, we're still a budding show. We're trying to get there. You probably already have you know, a million times more listeners than we do, but we have great listeners. So give the Screaming Meals show a chance. Maybe you'll find out something you literally have never known before or might never will ever use that information, but it's but it's great. We love that. Drivers having podcasts, drivers having the ability to talk to people, I think is is awesome. So good for you for doing that. I, I respect that. Thanks, Marcus, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you for being on our show. Uh, we appreciate your time. A lot of great information, honestly. I, I can continue asking you about a ton of that stuff, um, but we like to make sure people want to come back on again eventually. So uh, we're working on some cool stuff, I think, next year with IndyCar. It could be some great interaction there. So uh, appreciate your time. Uh, people follow Marcus Armstrong if you don't already. He already has more followers than most of us anyway. So big-time superstar. Uh Good luck next year. We'll see you on the streets. Uh, we'll see you at the racetrack and, you know, probably in the Indy 500 and stuff like that. So great, you know, great stuff. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And also we need to have a conversation about that electric karting race that you're talking about. Yeah. I'm so <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, let's have a chat. We'll do some off-season motorsport. <laughs> December 7th at the PRI Wait. show, anyone. I'm going to be there already. I'm now signing Marcus Armstrong to my team. If that's even a possibility. <laughs> awesome, Bert. Thanks a lot. Well, I thought that was a fantastic conversation. Ben, you guys are almost the same age. You're, you guys are youths. Um, I think Marcus is very well articulated. I, I think he is someone that, again, looking at his demographics that he sees in his social stuff, a lot of his fan base is Italian. I think that's great, obviously. The, the Tifosi, the Ferrari folk, follow their drivers, you know, very very closely and f1 twitter one of the scariest places i've seen on the internet one of the most vile places at times on the internet but my gosh they go to they they go to war talking about marcus armstrong because of him and his lady even you you search his name still on twitter for me and all it says even even on google you type in marcus armstrong the next thing is girlfriend so like Again, they big time relationship guy. You know, it's it's, it's hilarious to see that, but uh, love that following that he's got. Um, what did you think of? I mean, what what as as a fellow youth, good conversation. Yeah, I like the the Macau GP stuff you guys talked about. Um, I watched the highlights of that. Uh, I think it was earlier this week, and I I didn't even I forgot he ran in it just because like he talked about like you yeah. don't really see you call them older guys. He's what like twenty three. Well, um, go people that have made it. <laughs> right, people have made it. They're not going to go back down. So I think that was cool to um, um, see him run to that and talk about that because that that was a that was a cool race and kind of an insane event to watch. And I and I think I I think we should see more of that. I, Macau yeah. is such an incredible race. It is. You know, it is a little dangerous. It's a very high mm -hmm. speed track, and 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 you know, it's a street race. If you haven't seen it, you got to look it up. But like, I think we should have enough confidence. Like, if we go down there and finish freaking ten, who cares? You know what I mean? Right. Or if you get wrecked. Who cares? Like we we're already making livings being a racing driver. But like if you care about the pure purity of the sport, which I I do, 
I am clearly not afraid to show up and go try to finish. You know, shoot, I, we went, did a truck race for the first time, never driving the truck, me and Travis Pastrana. We finished in the top 20, had a great freaking time, right? But that's not the top level of NASCAR, right? Like, that's not the Cup Series. But we're not afraid to go. Like, my goal next year is to drive in the NASCAR Truck Series. That's a very professional level of racing, right? So, it, technically, so is Formula 3 to a certain to a certain extent, right? I think we should go down there and, and do it. I, I would love next year, let's put this in play. I'm going to call Trevor Carlin and say, hey, I want to do Macau next year. I want to do the Macau Grand Prix. I don't care how we get it done, but I want to do it. And I would love to see Colton Herta do it. I would love to see Marcus like, get the boys out there. Let's go do it. So who knows? This is our prediction for next year. We're going to have three IndyCar drivers, maybe IndyCar slash NASCAR drivers in the Macau Grand Prix. That would be awesome. Um, we'll see what happens. But great conversation with Marcus. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let us know. One quick note. We're going to have a, a quick note section. This is the new new quick notes with Connor Daly. Uh, there has been some more information about the Alex Pillow McLaren lawsuit. Um, that is obviously still going on. Alex Pillow, I know, uh, is is in Spain right now. He, I mean, Alex Pillow right now is, uh, you know, he's he's about to have a child. You know, like th- that's that is his focus. His focus right now is having a kid. But there's obviously a lawsuit going on. So I, I, I'm looking at Nathan Brown um, at by underscore Nathan, Nathan Brown on, on the Twitter sphere. Uh, Nathan Brown has actually two text messages that I have yet to respond to. I will respond to you, Nathan, I promise. Um, Pelo says he was promised an F1 ride. These are kind of tidbits. These are just in a tweet, right? So this is this is an, in any star article. There's an article. Jenna Fryer obviously put some stuff about this, but these are just... Nathan Nathan Nuggets. These are Nuggets from Nathan. Um, Pelo says he was promised an F1 ride. McLaren calls that baseless. McLaren still seeks F1-related losses. And Pelo says his CGR deal doesn't keep him from F1 calling McLaren's bluff. So that's wild. There's a lot in there. And my gosh, this is messy. And it could. I, I hope it doesn't get messy. But I know from the McLaren side that they do feel, you know, I, I, I do believe this is just a, an opinion for me. I do believe that they feel that there was some, uh, they, they just feel kind of not good about this at all, obviously. But as a driver, Alex Pelot is never going to have as much money as McLaren. So so this could be a tough one for Alex. I hope it's not because I like Alex a lot. I've, I've become great friends with him over the last few weeks. I've enjoyed playing video games with them. But again, something, this is just a uh, just a notes section. This is in the notes section, Connor Daily Notes, uh, quick notes section. Pay attention to it. So now we can get into the final part of our show, a great segment that I think people do enjoy. I hope people do enjoy. The Ricky Treadway Random Indy 500 Driver of the Week. The Ricky Treadway Random Indy 500 Driver of the Week. We went old. We went to the 1941 Indy 500, 1941 Indy 500, won by Floyd Davis. That's a name that I don't, I, I that 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 name could be a random Indy 500 driver of the week. But we don't do winners because obviously I should know Indy 500 winners. We should know Indy 500 winners. But I went and I happened to find a good one this week. This is we love these Overton Phillips. Overton Phillips is the 13th place finisher. In this year's Indy 500, the 1941, that is, Indy 500, Overton Phillips was born in 1908 in Iowa. He's an Iowa man. Uh, Nickname being Bunny. So Overton Phillips has a nickname of Bunny, which is hilarious. He was an authority on Bugatti cars, which is wild. A uh, very, very short uh, Wikipedia page. This is our source of information. Who knows if it's real or not. Um, but an Iowa man uh, set for time trials in the 1937 Indianapolis 500, but his car burst into flames when a crankshaft broke and punctured the gas tank. So that's insane. Crashed into the pit, killing George Warford, which I don't know if that's a driver or not. That is wild. Otto Rohde died of his injuries on June 1st. I mean, crazy pit accident. Who knows? Wild pit stop accident. But only one Indy 500 for Overton Phillips. Only 1941. Made the race. 
finish 13th. That's it. So one Indy 500, we happened to trip over. We found it for Overton Phillips. Uh, what a wild little story there. So Overton Phillips, this year's, this year, this week's Ricky Treadway Random Indy 500 Driver of the Week. We appreciate you guys listening. Please continue to do so if you like the show. Uh, please leave us a rating on the uh, on the rating systems. Uh, please be a friend and tell a friend about the show. Uh, I, I like to pay attention to how many people are listening to this show, you know, week by week and, and month by month. Um, and, and I'm just curious to see wh- what what would you like us to be talking about as we go into the off season? We're going to only have a couple more shows, a couple more shows. We're going to take a break in December uh, through the holiday season, the Christmas season. Love, love, love Christmas time. Uh, but I got a birthday coming up and we're definitely going to do a birthday show uh, when we got some, you know, there's always going to be news as well leading up to Christmas. There's there's things that need to get done before Christmas time. So there will be things to talk about. Appreciate you guys stopping by. Uh, and again, see you next week on, on Speed Street. Hey everyone, Connor Daly here. Please leave a like on this video if you did enjoy it. And also subscribe to the channel as well. That would be very helpful. Be a friend, tell a friend. Thank you so much for the support. And we'll see you on the next episode of Speed Street.